everyone. I'm Elizabeth Wyndham. You typically don't hear from me, but I am the producer of uh, Narcolepsy 360 podcast. And I get the pleasure today to interview Claire Crisp and Lindsay Justed about homeschooling in such a weird, weird time as what we're calling doing life during COVID. Um, most parents are now experiencing if not for the first time, how to homeschool their children, um, but also in a setting that's online. And we want to just discuss what it's like to be parenting children with narcolepsy while doing homeschooling and also other, their other children that don't have narcolepsy and just what the experience is like and any tips and tricks that they have um, in order to make your life a little bit easier because we're all in this together, right, ladies? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank well, you, Elizabeth. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for your time today. And why don't, um, Claire, why don't you start, but why don't you just kind of give your little bit of a background mm -hmm. um, on your education and what you do. And I believe you used to homeschool your kids back mm -hmm. in the day. Yeah, I did. That just seems so long ago, but... Um, my professional background actually is in physical therapy, again, very long time ago. And then I home educated our children for 10 years, um, our older two. Um, and then I moved into writing and now I'm the executive director for Wake Up Narcolepsy. Uh, in terms of homeschooling, yeah, so I started homeschooling our oldest two when they were young because we were moving around with my husband's job. So. Um, it was never really that I was anti-school or anything. It was just like, what is the best scenario for them? Um, and the years kind of built up and actually we did about 10 years and then they transitioned to school. I think Elliot was moving into fifth grade in the States and Liberty was moving towards seventh grade. Um, and now I find myself homeschooling Matilda, who's 13, for the first time. Wow. That's, um, I'm sure, a wild experience to go back into homeschooling, yeah. taking some time off. Yeah, it's, it's really different, actually, because the, um, you know, homeschooling young children, I think we should make that distinction. Homeschooling young children certainly seems to me, anyway, a very different experience to a teenager. I've never homeschooled a teenager. And of course, actually, because Matilda has narcolepsy, this is the first time to homeschool a child with her condition. So, um, yeah, it's been very surprising, some of the kind of positives um, and some of the challenges. Totally. And Lizzie, why don't you just kind of give us a little bit of an introduction and background on your experience in education as well. Right, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, my educational background began in the field of special education. I received my bachelor's degree as well as my master's degree in special ed. And then I began teaching in various types of K-12 classrooms. During that time, I also decided to pursue a degree in educational leadership. So once I had a master's in ed leadership, I moved into a position where I was overseeing compliance for special education programs. Moving forward, I guess I decided I really liked to be a student. So I continued with my education and received my PhD in educational leadership with an emphasis in special education policies and procedures. Um, eventually, I moved into an assistant principal position, and I also began teaching graduate level students online. Um, I used various platforms with this, and it looks very different, graduate students, than your K-12 students. But shortly after Noah was diagnosed with narcolepsy, teaching online became my full-time position until I started with Wake Up Narcolepsy as the director of development. But I remember telling my husband, probably three or four years ago now that online education was going to be the education of the future. That this is how I envisioned that one day we would see education all around. There would be less brick and mortar schools and teachers would be utilizing these online platforms, you know, kind of like Jetsons era type thing. But at that time, I obviously wasn't thinking the future was 2020. I was thinking <laughs> 30 years from now. <laughs> My kids were schooling their kids. <laughs> So I don't think we're quite ready for where we are right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. Um, well, thank you both for, you know, just coming alongside your families and being teachers right now to them while you're still trying to work a full-time job. I know 
it's not easy. I'm just working my full-time job and I have no kids. So I can only imagine <laughs> the level of stress and organization and brain capacity that you have to use during this time. And I know you're definitely not alone. There's millions and millions of people experiencing that as well. So thankfully there is that little bit of like communal, we're all in this together, but it's still not easy because each person's experience is definitely different. So definitely am uh, cheerleading you on from LA, uh, just, you know, congratulating you for doing all this hard work. Um, Lindsay, uh, what are the kind of like the main issues schools, colleges, and teachers are facing right now, educating kids in isolation? Well, from what I'm seeing, each state and really specifically each district is kind of doing something a bit different. So there's no one size fits all when it comes to what online education should look like. Um, so the graduate students that I work with, many of them are already teachers, they're already in the classrooms. So I'm really getting a good look at perspectives from all over the nation right now. And what I can tell you is some teachers are able to create lesson plans, send those home to the parents, and the parents are really responsible for implementing those lesson plans. Um, they might have links to click on, but the parent needs to be there to assist more so than what is happening with other schools. Um, you know, some teachers are sending home packets, kind of like what you would see during the summer, you know, when you're trying to keep the students from that summer slide where we send home kind of review packets. So it's not necessarily that they're gaining new information, they're continuously reviewing what they've learned so they don't fall further behind. And then still other districts, which this one happens to be at our district is doing, they're really providing lessons via the online platforms and they're meeting with the students every day face to face to deliver these lessons, you know, with a webcam and all, just like we're doing now. And then the students, after they've received the lesson, work on the independent work that's associated with that lesson. Um, I think when the mandates came down to close the schools, no one was prepared for what that was actually gonna look like. And I think depending on your geographic region and even your socioeconomic status, things that people take for granted, like high-speed internet access, or access to computers and technology. And all of those are causing huge disparities between what we're seeing as we're attempting to educate our students. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to look at, we still have parents who are going to work every day because they're essential workers. They don't have the luxury to be able to stay home to help. And those that are at home, many of them are still working full time from their houses. And now they also have to step in and they have to assist their children and things that we haven't done forever. I mean, my daughter's taking algebra, high school algebra. I passed high school algebra in high school. I haven't looked at high school algebra since high school. Exactly. So when she comes to me with questions, I'm not prepared to help her. Oh. I have to go and review the entire chapter before I can offer help on one question. Hmm. So, you know, those types of issues are really starting to arise when it comes to what this education is going to look like for the rest hmm. of the year. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I think that's the other thing that's major is that when this all started, there was no timeline. And so there was like maybe the expectation that kids would be going back to school, but uh, by all indications, it looks like no kids are going back to right. their, uh, actual physical classrooms for this school year. And so the, the greater responsibility again is going to be both parent and teacher birding it together, but it's falling harder on the parent right now. Um, because right. they're the and ones our kids, the present. You know, they're used to spending all day with their classmates. They're used to those social interactions with their peers. Yeah. And now the only way they can do that is somehow through technology. Yeah. You know, our teachers are being asked to build the airplane as they're flying it for what this is going to continue to look like. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, Claire, did you want to add anything? Um, yeah, thanks, Lindsay. That's really helpful. I would say that um, you're right to point out about being prepared because as a homeschooler, you have that luxury, don't you, if, you've, if this has been an intentional decision. Um, and I hear what you're saying and relate to you about the math. Um, we've got the same issues here. You know, obviously, uh, what our children 
um, are studying kind of also reflect our own personal strengths and weaknesses. So uh, as a homeschooler, if we had a blind spot as a teacher, then we could provide that, you know, like my kids um, had extra Latin and math tuition. Um, so we haven't got that luxury right now. That's the difficulty. Um, but the other thing I would say about, um, you know, working from home, the, the children are studying from home on the screen. That that's not really my idea of homeschooling. Sure. Um, I think that I think it's a great adjunct to um, learning, but I, I don't love the fact that there's actually now more screens, more yeah. screen time. Um, I understand that it's uh, important, but it's we don't have that kind of luxury of planning a curriculum like we would if we were being really intentional about this homeschooling year because you know we started this what three four weeks ago and as you say Elizabeth we're looking at going really till September uh, it's kind of a long time I mean if you if you really thought about it you could pack almost an academic year of content into that six month period but to go back to Lindsay's point, you know, schools are doing things in different ways. Some are providing the pack, just go home and do the pack. Less screen time. Others are online. Um, and others are kind of like, you know, very minimal in terms of their provision. So, um, you know, you can, you can approach that from different directions. I quite like having the freedom to teach like some, you know, more creatively. But also when we think about the child with narcolepsy, how we can use this situation to their advantage. So um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a big, big question and a, and a big opportunity for us as parents, I think. Sure. Obviously, um, well, both of you are parents of children with narcolepsy. Um, and we recognize that each kid's experience with narcolepsy is different and uh, how their symptoms uh, it would manifest be the right word or yeah okay so manifest mm -hmm. is different um, and I know we're kind of talking about uh, kind of like a greater observation so please anybody who's listening to us right now take it with a little bit of a grain of salt because they're speaking from their perspective and their experience but in terms of this new nebulous um, situation in teaching, in being homeschooled, in dealing with the various um, uh, resources that have been given by the school or teacher or district. Um, how are you seeing or how do you feel this is going to be as like a greater impact to children with narcolepsy specifically? Um, Lindsay, do you want to go? <laughs> sure. Um, I think that children with narcolepsy are going to be especially impacted by this change. I mean, the research out there is already telling us that there's many social implications for children who are diagnosed with narcolepsy. Um, this is an area of the child that is heavily impacted from the start, and this is under typical conditions. So now they're no longer in an environment that is in essence, forcing them to socialize with one another. Um, I think it's giving them more of an opportunity to kind of retreat into their own minds, whereas at least my goal for my son is to kind of push him out there to make him socialize with others more, to get him involved with other people. And I think the fact that now he's at home and the only time he sees other people is on the computer screen when he's in his class, it's really minimizing those opportunities for him. Um, I will say that one thing that we've gone and done, and I am not a huge fan of gaming. Actually, I don't understand it. I don't really care for it. I went and I got him headphones with a microphone, so he at least has the opportunity <laughs> to socially engage with somebody yeah. besides us. So his classmates that are playing the same games, he gets on with his buddies and they can have a conversation. They can talk about their day, what they're doing, the game, everything. But at least it's forcing that socialization that he's now missing because he's not in school. Mm -hmm. And it's real time socialization too, which I think is important to know. Right. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, Claire, did you want to add anything to 
kind of like the children with narcolepsy experience with this situation? Yeah, I th think, um, I think, you know, we have to bear in mind how different our children with narcolepsy are, whether they, you know, what, when their onset was, their type one, type two, um, you know, how their symptoms play out in terms of, um, yeah, as you say, Elizabeth manifestation in the day, what meds they're on. But certainly from our perspective, um, Matilda's always struggled, I think, with a school day in terms of its physical challenges and the shame and the stigma around a nap. Um, now, when she was very young, so you know, four, five, six, seven, um, wasn't such a big deal. And then she had a little bed at the back of the classroom back then and took her naps without too much problem. Uh, and then as she got older, sort of moving into third, fourth, fifth grade, she decided that wasn't cool. Uh, she would sleep with her head on the desk and do a little sign to the teacher, like, I need to go now. This is it. I'm checking out. Well, now as a 13 year old, she's deciding not to nap at all, that it's not cool um, and that she can hang on uh, to the end of the day. And of course, what that really means is she crashes in the car on the way home. Uh, has a pretty difficult evening with extended naps and then that impacts a nightmare. So, um, you know, we've got those different phases of childhood development with narcolepsy. So actually take all the school structure away for her as a 13 year old. Um, and we've got something much more workable. So she's actually doing very well at home. Um, to Lindsay's point about trying to force socialization, I really uh, respect that and I think I could do a better job as a parent. Um, Matilda's always had a very like rich interior life as we call it living in her mind palace um, but certainly when I've spoken to doctors about this aspect of her being very introverted and um, not kind of you know not just quite getting it socially sometimes that um, this is something we do need to work on so with homeschooling if, if this is what we're doing for six months or more, we need to be really mindful of socialization. And to Lindsay's point about gaming, I have a son that games and we've always been a little bit like, well, you know, what, what is he doing up there? But if, you, if Elliot was here, he would say he has loads of friends. Um, he connects with them. It is live. It's, I guess to us as parents, it feels very virtual but it is a real community. Um, so if that's our option, then I think that that's, you know, a good one, certainly at the moment. Definitely, definitely. Um, I think you both kind of spoke to this a little bit already, but um, maybe we could parse out uh, in more detail about what are some potential negatives for children with narcolepsy being educated at home at this time? I think as somebody who has been a, an observer learning from people with narcolepsy and caregivers, that schedule is a big thing. And mm -hmm. I think that being in the classroom day to day is a very structured schedule. So I imagine that that is helpful for children with narcolepsy, but um, you know, like what are the implications of trying to figure out a schedule while you're working a full-time job um, and trying to educate and support your child while you are all home? Well, I think it's all about planning, um, actually, where you know you do have all these variables of everyone in the house because of course it's not just us and our child with narcolepsy for us there's five of us and we've all got different needs true um most of that revolves around sharing wi-fi bandwidth which has its own challenges but i think uh, planning is really key um and actually um you know if you've got a child with narcolepsy you can listen to their bodies a lot more if it doesn't matter that they need to like jump in the car at 7 30 and you know, make sure they're awake still all the way through till lunch and all this. So um, for Matilda, it's been really positive and we've actually started to tweak her, the timing of her day meds to suit her and her naps to suit her more listening to her body. This has been really important as a, th as a sort of teenager because it's essentially what she needs to do going forward. Mm -hmm. 
you know, not to, not for me to, or any of us to be really directive, but for her to think, well, wait a minute, you know, today I need this and I might need a shorter nap or a longer nap and having that ownership. So she's really enjoyed um, the kind of scheduling side of it to meet her own needs. So I think that's been a positive. The big challenge um, is physical, it's getting out for her. Uh, because at school they have to do PE and, you know, and games and lacrosse and everything. And it's like pulling teeth, sort of trying to incorporate PE into a home school schedule because it, it doesn't really translate. Um, so that that's where our kind of problems are right now. And what about you, Lindsay? So I can obviously only really speak of our experience this far. So Noah really thrives on structure. And, and in fact, we attribute most of his success to the structure that his day is kind of implemented upon. So for him, that school piece is huge. That is a huge portion of structure that kind of regulates the rest of his day. Mm -hmm. The interactions he has with his classmates, the interactions he has with his teachers, all of those things keep him interested, keep him awake, keep him going during the day. Mm -hmm. So during the school day, he rarely will take a nap at school. Um, if he does, it's during one of those kind of down times and it might be for five minutes at his desk. And then he's up and going and interacting and participating. So that lack of structure for him when we moved online was a bit difficult initially. So we've tried to keep the day as structured as possible. Um, but since I'm working as well, I can't really monitor his every move and everything that he's doing. So the first week, the teachers were assigning work on his Google Classroom, and the video components weren't yet added. Mm. So he was just responsible for completing this work every day. And mm. he was very sleepy, mm -hmm. you know, sitting in front of a computer, zero interaction, completing work. Mm -hmm. He would fall asleep mm -hmm. during keyboard. He would mm -hmm. fall asleep, you know, mid-typing. And this was going on and on each day, just more and more sleepy. And I, I kind of figured this was really going to go downhill if we have to do this the rest of the year. Yeah. Luckily, like I said, they started implementing these video chats, video lessons. So those really keep him engaged and they really break up his day as well. So it's, he's got the video lesson, then he does the work, then it's time for another video mm -hmm. lesson. So that's really helped him. It's really helped with that structure. He still wakes up at the same time every day. He still eats breakfast at the same time every day. I don't let him sit in his pajamas all day, even though I sit in mine all day sometimes. Mm. <laughs> he has to get dressed. Yeah. He has to start his day like he would if you were going to school. Um, the moment I take that away and it looks more like a weekend, it looks a lot lazier. Mm. He's a lot sleepier. You know, things just don't really progress the right way. So everything except for the fact that we mm. don't physically get in a car and we don't drive to school and then I don't pick him up after school and drive home, everything else looks the exact same. I make him go outside for his PE every day. Every day at school, they had to run the track. So I make him go out in the backyard and he has to jump on the trampoline or run around the backyard or we go swimming, something to keep him physically moving. And then in the mm -hmm. afternoons, since he no longer has homework, he does have the ability then, you know, to interact with his friends, to do his gaming, to interact with his sister, to play games. You know, we try to go on a bike ride in the evenings just to keep him out and to get him moving. Mm -hmm. Because if I left it up to him, he would sit on an iPad all day long, mm. he would interact with no one, and then it, he would fall asleep, you know, in between videos, wake back up and go right back to an iPad. Mm -hmm. um, the one downside we're really seeing though is the cataplexy. Mm -hmm. So in school, he keeps up enough of a wall, enough of a barrier, to where he doesn't have cataplexy all day long at home. He really lets down his guard. Yeah. So we're seeing a lot more cataplexy than what we would typically see if he were in school all day. Mm. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I do want to talk about the benefits of homeschooling because again, we've kind of flirted with some of those ideas and thoughts and experiences, but I also, <clears throat> wanted to ask you both if you had any ideas in terms of accommodations. Obviously, accommodations are huge 
for kids with narcolepsy uh, when they're in their actual physical uh, classrooms, you know, advocating for them to have time for a nap or being able to stand up when they're feeling tired, just different things like that, more time on tests, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm not sure if either of you have experience trying to get some accommodations for your children while they're at home and doing schooling. Um, and if not, that's fine. But if you do have experience or ideas, what are some things that you would suggest people could uh, request for accommodations for their children with narcolepsy who are home, being homeschooled mm -hmm. right now? Mm -hmm. So any accommodations that they receive in school during this time of homeschooling, those accommodations hold. Right. They don't end just because they're not in school. So for instance, if they are taking time tests on the computer, but they get extended time, they still get that extended time to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I think some of the beauty of the homeschooling though, is the fact that, you know, an accommodation might be that if they need a nap, they have that opportunity. Yes. Well, when they're at home, they have that opportunity whenever they need it. So I think in that regard, it might be easier to implement some of the accommodations. You know, standing up, they can stand up and do their lessons. They can walk around with an iPad completing their work. Yeah. You know, they don't always have to be sitting in front of a computer at a desk. There's, there's options for that. Um, Claire, what are you finding? Um, yeah, I think because because our homeschooling looks slightly different in that I'm the teacher <laughs> and therefore I get to kind of set the rules. But I, I really appreciate your comment about the dressing gown, wearing, the kids wearing the robe or their pajamas down um, stairs, you know, like even if they could, they'd do that all day. I mean, I see Matilda's pink dressing gown, like I'm just, no, you cannot wear that. You need to be downstairs at 9.30 ready. Um, so in terms of accommodations, I've just, we've just done a period like two weeks of listening, you know, like resetting, listening to her body and just, okay, in an ideal world, you would start your academic work after some exercise and chore at 10, really, uh, and after the first nap. Um, so I think, you know, it's a good opportunity just to put everything back on the table and rethink it even if it needs a bit more tweaking. And um, I also really love the opportunity they have to be creative mm -hmm. and say, actually, I really want to do this or study that. Um, so it turns out that Matilda's never studied World War II, for example, from a European perspective, just missed it. Um, so, you know, I think when you feed some of their, all of their needs, I remember when I was homeschooling, I followed a philosophy called Charlotte Mason it said give your children three things every day something to think about something to do and something to love um, so whether that's you know whatever that is um, and I can think of things that Matilda loves like her kittens and her reading and stuff but something to think about and they can have that ownership and direction and, and actually we've had a conversation about you know what what interests you academically what what haven't you you know for them to have to have that time to explore um and then hopefully with this video we'll post resources but when i was homeschooling you know a long time ago um there weren't the sort of there wasn't the same scale of resources online that there are now um so on one hand yes we don't want our kids to be on the screen all the time on the other hand, as a, as a parent and as a teacher, there's loads of resources, whether they're literature studies or you know, language programs or whatever. So I think you know, if we're creative enough, we can find something that really piques their interest and give them some ownership in their education as well as ownership over their physical needs. So, yeah. so I don't know, I think we should maybe revisit these questions in about four months, yeah. you know, when we're all a little bit like, okay, we're done. Um, and of course, we're isolated, aren't we? As, as Lindsay said, and that poses, we can't do some of the other things that true homeschooling affords, like field trips and traveling. So these are really unique times with unique challenges, I think. Yeah, I think what I am hearing from both of you is that it, it's a unique opportunity for you um, as a caregiver, but also for your kids to um, 
really educate in terms of being learning intuition of one's body and that mm -hmm. intuition and how to adapt in this new environment of working mm -hmm. and doing school at home. And, um, and in that things like movement is important mm -hmm. and um, knowing that you need to stand up when you're feeling tired is, is important. And, mm -hmm. and maybe one thing that could be beneficial that comes out of that is that your children will feel more empowered and secure in mm -hmm. um, living out what they need when they're back in their schools and back in their classrooms. And hopefully some of that um, stigma and insecurity about the, you know, enacting that around their, their classmates will be a little less. That would be mm -hmm. definitely a hope for mm -hmm. all, all kids who have narcolepsy mm -hmm. um, during this time, at, at least for me to see that um, they can feel a little mm -hmm. bit more empowered in advocating for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, is there any other, I mean, we've talked about multiple different benefits throughout this conversation. Is there any other benefit that you're seeing that you feel like we could talk a little bit more about? Yeah, I would um, mention like life skills, you know, that, that great <laughs> important thing that's often overlooked. Um, so whether that's cooking or gardening or learning to polish shoes or, or get the sewing machine out and fix clothes, um, you know, we kind of like laugh about those quaint things, but actually it's really important, isn't it, to know how to cook healthily um, and just looking for great resources there. The other thing I would say that we've done, and this is a slightly delicate subject for, for many children with narcolepsy, but they, we know that they you know, tend towards depression and inactivity um, and therefore weight gain. Not, not all of them, but, but some. Mm -hmm. um, we know there's research being done on the reasons why that, that is part of the condition. It's not their fault in any way, but it's a big challenge. So, um, Another opportunity we've, we've kind of explored is Matilda looking into, in her quote, science, um, a program that studies, um, yeah, the circulation, anatomy, physiology, um, because she has had high blood, blood pressure in the past and high cholesterol, and for her to really understand what that is. Mm -hmm. not just a trip to the doctor's office and another thing she needs to deal with. So, I mean, she's a bit older, obviously, than, um, than Noah. And I know he has different needs, um, physical needs and um, health issues. So, you know, whether it's looking at depression, weight gain, exercise, uh, nutrition, um, and some of these comorbid factors that play into our child's diagnosis, then maybe this is a good opportunity just to just to step back and give them a, a deeper understanding mm, yeah. of their broader health um, and not just this this is for cataplexy and you're gonna you know this is your stimulant it's gonna keep you away you know really to, to kind of go in on a, on a slightly deeper level so they have that that knowledge definitely that's interesting Lindsay, did you have anything else to add? You know, one other area I would maybe caution against is, I know with Noah, he can get very aggressive when he's sleepy, when things don't go his way. And we obviously see that aggression more at home than what he would, you know, portray in a school environment or out with peers or anything right. of that nature. I think we need to be very careful when they're at home that you know, we don't make that okay. Mm -hmm. That we don't yeah. say, I get why he's acting that way. I'm going to look past it mm -hmm. because the problem right now is that's his only interaction. So as a 10 year old, if his only interaction, if we're making it okay, if we're saying, oh, we understand why you're aggressive. Yes, I might understand why you're aggressive, but it's not okay to be aggressive. This is what we're going to do instead. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we make it okay, then when he is back in school, when he is back around his peers, mm -hmm. that's what's going to come out because now that's his new normal. That's mm -hmm. what he's mm -hmm. right. So I think we just, we need to be very careful of, you know, with any child, but specifically when you're dealing with, with a child with narcolepsy, that 
we still have certain boundaries, the boundaries that are socially acceptable boundaries. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that those stay in play, even while we're stuck in isolation. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a very it's good point. Huge. Mm. Um, huge. What are some resources that you both would recommend for parents uh, to educate um, or help in educating their children with narcolepsy currently at home? Lindsay, why don't you start? Well, if you go to Wake Up Narcolepsy's website, <laughs> a slew of resources for parents to interact with their child with, different resources to teach with. Um, one thing I would say, though, is always start out with your school district's webpage because mm -hmm. oftentimes these districts have, you know, licensed programs that they've purchased that are available mm -hmm. to your child even outside of, you know, those brick and mortar walls that your child has login information for and to be able to utilize those programs at home is huge um, again I know our district specifically has a lot of programs that they would use in school on a daily basis and now that kind of needs to be transferred to where they're able to use them at home and the longer that students are learning from home you know, the more that these schools are pushing out those programs. So I, I would say the first stop is definitely the school's website and go to, you know, the student's resources section of that website and see what they have to offer because there's probably quite a bit there. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, that's, that's huge. Um, I, yeah, I, I love looking for um, independent resources. That's a great reminder, Lindsay, that um, our schools provide those kind of mandatory you know, requirements in terms of curriculum. There are lots of other uh, ways to find information. I like Khan Academy. I think that's American based. Um, I like some of the homeschool sites just to kind of pick and choose where, you know, you get some inspiration and some ideas and literature studies um so yeah there's a there's a lot out there even with the language programs actually i asked matilda to email her french teacher and say what's the best you know is it duolingo is it rosetta mm -hmm. stone how can i keep my french up because you know we're going to get back to september it's not going to go well with with languages so um certainly use the teachers as a resource too um yeah i think that's that's kind of where we're at. Um, just trying to think if there's anything else that we've, oh yeah, so for example, I've taught um, in the last few weeks some history uh, through literature and then just Googled, you know, we did Lord of the Flies, which is a very British text, but, um, and now we're doing Unbroken because we're looking at the American perspective of World War II. But if you just Google those things um, and, type in you know teach or parent resources then you're going to get loads and loads of information so really you could be pretty creative um if you wanted just to supplement what they were doing at school mm -hmm. and whether you can be creative or you cannot you know no judgment to you parents because mm -hmm. we really respect that you are uh, teaching your kids right now and most likely working from home. Um, right. Obviously, both of you are experiencing this right now and it's a very unique challenge. Um, mm -hmm. and it's a unique challenge every day to, you know, take your kids to school and then work mm -hmm. and then, you know, have dinner, whatever, whatever kind of responsibilities you enact throughout the evening. But now um, it's all home and uh, there's probably new and new unique pressures that you're experiencing right now. Um, mm. Are you, yeah, I would, what kind of yeah. strategies are you employing to kind of offset the personal and professional pressures? Um, yeah, what's, what's your experience been? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think we're so fortunate that we um, live in a house with doors. <laughs> you know, it's not open plan. So um, when we lived in California, this would have been a really um, much more challenging situation. So we can close the door. I don't quite have a sign on there saying, do not disturb. Um, but on the other hand, I do think there's such value in the children and them seeing us work. And, you know, they, they understand these are unique times and, 
um, you know, none of us are in our office and we're all having to be very adaptable and flexible. So um, I actually quite like the fact that they, they see me work and they understand there are times when I'm accessible and times when, you know, unless they're like bleeding or something, you know, times when they cannot interrupt. So um, I don't think that's a bad thing at all. Lindsay, what's your, Lindsay, tell us what your experience is working. You have an office, you have an office. I, I do have an office. Um, unfortunately, I now share an office with my 10 year old colleague. <laughs> who has taken up more and more of my office as the days go on. My daughter's office is upstairs. So she's pretty self-sufficient in what she's doing. Um, you know, I think stress is high for everyone right now. I think mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. it's, it's really difficult when you're in the middle of working, you're doing something that's kind of time sensitive. And all of a sudden you hear mom, mom, I need your help with this mom. Um, so just understanding and maybe making sure that the kids understand that it's okay. If you yeah. don't know how to do it, it's okay. It's we'll deal with it later. It isn't so important that it has to be right this moment, that everything has to stop to get it done. Your teachers understand. Your teachers know that you are navigating new waters here. Okay. It is okay if something was due on Thursday at three o'clock and you turned mm -hmm. it up and Friday at one o'clock. Yeah. It's okay. Um, and I think also telling ourselves that it's okay. Yeah. You know, I mm -hmm. make a list of what I need to do every day I can't tell you now the last time I've actually gotten through that list, Right. but it's okay. That list is going to be there tomorrow uh -huh. and there's going to be more on it and I'm going to tackle what I can tackle and then it's going to be over and then I'm going to tackle it the next day and it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me as somebody who does not have kids, but is also living through this weird situation mm -hmm. of a pandemic that has been something that I've needed to remind myself as well because, you know, we are going through a collective trauma all together in our own unique ways. And that does occupy space in your brain, your ability to concentrate and to be productive. Mm -hmm. And I think this also is like a really interesting mm -hmm. time to learn that, again, you're confronted with this fact that the, the value of who you are is not by how productive you are. Right. And um, the work will always be there and everybody can give each other a little bit of grace, if not a lot of grace right now. Um, and just, yes, we'll get the work done, but it may be a day or two later <laughs> than we mm -hmm. expected or hoped for. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I think the, the most important thing that you can do is, uh, give yourself opportunities to let go of stress by saying it's okay. Mm -hmm. And you right. know, that stuff will mm -hmm. still be there. Um, and then I just want to say thank you to both of you um, for what you're doing. Cause obviously I have the pleasure of working with you um, and getting to uh, do some amazing things with wake up narcolepsy, but also thank you for, uh, also teaching your kids right now and mm -hmm. um, supporting them and helping them grow. Um, and we just also want to thank all the parents who are watching this or listening to this, just to let you know that you're doing a good job, regardless how you feel in this moment or <laughs> what this past week has been, but you're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. And there are people mm -hmm. that don't even know you who are rooting for you. Um, and you know, we will mm. get through this and, um, and hopefully when we come through the other side, a lot more compassion, empathy, and presence will be offered to one another, uh, since we all have experienced of, you know, we're going through something super unique, but, um, before we end this, is there anything else that you would like to say, whether to um, parents who are working or who are experiencing homeschooling for the first time? This is your moment. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I remember something um, happened so, so many times when I was homeschooling. 
that you know I had a bad day with the children and um, felt like dreadful teacher and parent and like what are we doing and this is just so hard you know and uh, Oliver would say to me everyone has a bad day now and again like they could have a bad day in school, you could have a bad day at work. And I remember that being sort of a bit of a revelation at the time, like, oh yeah, that could happen. So, you know, we have bad days, right? Whether we're homeschooling during COVID or, or wherever we are. Um, and the other thing I would, the last thing I would say actually is that um, the mental health of our children is really important, isn't it? And how do we navigate that during COVID? I mean, we're, we're all basically, as parents, I feel at this point making it up as we go along, although I'm not sure we communicate that to our kids, but um, we've, we've just tried a couple of things. And again, you know, take this um, for what it is, but we've just done check-ins as a family where we've explained this is what's going on um, because we're not sure what sort of national and international news they're picking up. Okay. Um, just to give a broad overview of COVID and how, it's impacting um, our nation and why they're not in school. And then we've also done just one-on-ones where we're like, how are you doing? Um, is there anything, you know, and actually some of their gripes are pretty mundane, like they're, they're annoyed about chores. You know, they, one, one comment was like, I feel like a slave, like not really, but honestly, so <laughs> I feel like a slave, but um, more to the point where, you know, are they, are they okay? What are their fears? And, and just, um, yeah, just that it's okay to be really, really concerned and frightened. Um, I think as children, they have their fears about us because they think we're old. Um, you know, yeah. <laughs> we're not technically in the sort of um, danger zone, but I think it's just important to hear their voice, really. Sure, definitely. Well, I was just going to say that I completely agree with Claire with that one. I think we need to be very aware that our children know that this is not a typical day. They know something's going on. Um, that fear that they might be feeling, that they might be holding in and putting on that brave face so that you don't appear more stressed, you know, just be very aware that they're hearing the same things that we're hearing. When they talk to their friends, they're mm -hmm. hearing other people's perspectives and what their parents have heard. Mm -hmm. So just understanding that, you know, it's a scary time. And even if they're not, you know, sitting there crying and telling you how scared they are, they are probably scared and they don't know what tomorrow is gonna bring. Right. And just understanding that and not adding to the stress that they're dealing with as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So good. Thank you both yeah, for your time you. and your insight today. And we truly hope that this is helpful to the parents listening or watching this. And um, like we said, we just want to commend you for what you're doing right now. You're doing it and we're proud of you and you're going to get through the day. And, um, and just, yeah, please do utilize our resource page. We do have a lot of um, resources in terms of um, online engagement for education, whether it's going to like National Geographic and learning about an animal a little bit further to art museums that you can look at art to games that help with brain development. There's a lot of resources on our page um, that we hope will be a assistance to you. So um, please, please, please utilize it if you're looking for something mm -hmm. to help you out for, you know, today, the next day, whenever. As Elizabeth said, go to our website, www.wakeupnarcolepsy.org. Um, check us out as an organization and also resources for parents for your children with narcolepsy. Elizabeth, thanks so much. Good to see you. Yeah, it was wonderful to chat with you both this morning. Have a great day. Thank you. You too.